we that we lift up our voices tonight and we declare that indeed you are everything. That it's not just a song, but from the depths of our heart, we acknowledge that you are everything to us. You're the first, you're the last, you're everything in between. Father, we say thank you for being the air that we breathe, for being a provider, Lord. For being a protector, beloved, let's lift up our voices together where you are, if possible, on mute and let's pray. Just declare to the Lord how much he means to you. Father, we thank you for indeed you everything. You are going out, you are coming in. You pave the way, the path that we tread upon. We say thank you, Father, for being a guide, for being a defender. For being our strength, for the air that we breathe. Mm. Daddy, we say thank mm. you mm. for us, oh God. provider we say thank you god we say thank you lord this night will come with hearts of reverence to acknowledge you for being the giver of the word for being the spirit of understanding that we partake of every night when we gather but once more we have come to the one who it means everything to us to partake at his table so that we may live that is fine that is spirit Thank you for being so gentle with us, Lord, when we fall short of grace, Lord. Thank you for being everything. Not just a song, Lord. We just say thank you for the depths of our welcoming you into the atmosphere. Thank you. And we say that let your will be done on the platform here tonight, Lord. That you will lead us here. Father, we say thank you. We bless you. We magnify you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Love, please, if you do have your elements, just bring them out. Let's partake together. As we hold the bread in our hands, we say, Father, we thank you for tonight. We have gathered once again to break bread. And Father, we are prophetically declaring, even through the elements in our hands, that the word of God will be broken. And as we partake of it, it becomes one with us, one in our spirits, one with our spirits, that we will act according to the words that we receive tonight. In the name of Jesus, we say thank you for the body of Jesus and thank you for the broken body of Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's break together and partake. We've come to remember Jesus. We've come to remember the Lord God Almighty who, who gave us his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. We say thank God for Jesus. We say thank Jesus for the blood that he shed on the cross on our behalf. Today we are partakers of this blood. We are beneficiaries of the blood of Jesus. We thank God this evening for the redemptive power in the blood of Jesus that have redeemed us out of darkness into the marvelous lights of Christ. Today we can see better because of redemption power. Today we can understand better because of redemption. He redeemed us out of the ignorance of our minds and has enlightened us once again with his word and tonight we've come to be enlightened even further for his glory in jesus name amen let's amen. Okay. amen okay so beloved tonight we'll continue with ezra chapter three so I'm just going to open it up here for us. We're going to go through Ezra chapter 3 and Ezra chapter 4. I'll read through Ezra 3 quickly for us. 
Let's follow through. You can follow through on the screen or in your Bibles. So it says, rebuilding the altar. Now, before I read Ezra 3, I actually have a question. For those who read their Bibles, yesterday I asked a question and <laughs> we didn't get all get the answers correct. I want to ask a question. What does the name Zerubbabel mean? Does anybody know what the name Zerubbabel mean? We talked about him yesterday, but... I know what Ezra means. <laughs> Okay, what does Ezra mean? <laughs> Help. Okay, does anyone know what Zerubbabel means? So Zerubbabel means um, son of Babylon. Now, when you think about the, his name, it says Zerubbabel, Babel. We talked about Babylon and Babel yesterday, that Babel is the... <laughs> Babel is the, the, the Hebrew um, name for Babylon and Babylonos is a Greek for Babylon and they all mean confusion, amen. To tell you so many things, but it comes down to that one thing, confusion. Okay, so Zeru Babel, so son of Babylon because Babel means Babylon, amen. Now, the next question I have for us tonight is, did Zerubbabel complete building the temple? Bible students, let's not be quiet. Did Zerubbabel complete building the temple? No. So what part did he build and what part did he not build? Did he the first temple? So Zerubbabel built the temple? Is that what you're saying? No, Zer that, the guy built the temple. He did, right? The second temple? Zerubbabel. Is that whom you're talking about? Yeah. Is yes. Okay. So I see here that, okay, then one person says that Zerubbabel... Oh, okay. The foundation. So Sister Coco says that Nehemiah built the walls and Sister Bernadette says the same thing. Then Sister Coco says Zerubbabel laid the foundation. Okay, now Sister Coco, if Zerubbabel laid the foundation, who built the temple? Because Nehemiah built the walls. Because you'll be building a wall to protect the temple that had already been built. So who built the temple? Okay, so we'll be looking at that this evening. Amen. Okay, so just some questions to get our minds thinking as we go through scripture so that we are involved in the process. Okay, so the Bible says rebuilding the altar. I'm going to read through real quickly, then I'll extract some points from it. It says, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, and his associates, began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to, to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. Then in accordance with what is written there, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred our festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Now it says rebuilding the temple. Here it talked about rebuilding the altar. 
Now it says rebuilding the temple. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Ty, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shetil, Joshua, son of Josadak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from the captivity to Jerusalem began the work. They appointed Levites, 20 years old and older, to supervise, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Kadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodavia and the sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the, the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaf with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Amen. So that's Ezra chapter three for us. Amen. So we're going to extrapolate a few points, a few lessons that we can learn from Ezra chapter three. I'm sharing my slides right now. Okay, so I'll go a few verses at a time. Here it says, on, I'll be reading a few verses at a time and just explaining. And if you have something to say, feel free to indicate. The Bible says, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, remember from chapter two, they all, all the exiles came into Jerusalem, at least the first group that was led by Zerubbabel, they came in, now they have settled, they came in for a reason, to rebuild the temple and to do everything that concerns it. And they were not expecting to face obstacles. Remember, we are studying the book of Ezra because we want to specifically identify obstacles that could possibly be faced when advancing the kingdom of God. And we can all agree that they left, they all left Babylon to Jerusalem under the supervision of King Cyrus of Persia in order to advance the kingdom. In this case, rebuild the temple completely. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem, talking about the power of unity. It was impossible to even begin that project without unity. Amen. It's very important that we function as one. Now, quite often we, we may think that to be United is the same to be one. You know, people can be united, but they are not one. When it comes to unity, we unite for the sake of peace, but oneness is for the sake of vision. Amen. That's the difference between unity and oneness. So they came together as one people. You could live under the same roof, united, but you all are divided in vision. That's the difference, amen. So these people were not only united, but they were one in vision, amen. So they were able to advance this project. So too, when it comes to kingdom advancement, this is our own group. This is where we belong. When we have a project to advance in the kingdom, we need to come together as one. Because from every indication, we are united. We are all on the platform, the GDP, but we are not one. We are united, but we are not one. Because sometimes 50% or 80% are going one way, but 20% are going the other. 
evidence by responses, evidence by involvement in what is being done. So what's the call tonight? The call tonight is that we function as one people because we have said with our own words and our own voices that this is where we want to be. So beyond unity is oneness. That's the call for tonight. Amen. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shetil, and his associates, began to build the altar of the, of, of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Many things to talk about here, but I'll just highlight a few. They began to build the altar because the altar had been destroyed. Previously, Solomon had built this altar, this temple in Jerusalem where people came and made prayers and offered sacrifices, but it was destroyed. Evidence by what we spoke about at length yesterday, which we wouldn't go back into, amen. So it was destroyed. So the people had to rebuild that altar. So you see that they ask, the idea of altar is not just new to us. It's not uh, specific to us. It's something that had been, is the, it had been the way of life for the believers in the past. They believed in their altar to a place where immediately they, they, they experienced freedom. The first thing that came to their mind was that they should go and rebuild their altar. Amen. If you are the one who had been set free from captivity, what would be the first thing that you think of doing? Would you think about your altar? Would you think about the fact that, oh, now I am free to do anything I can do to keep the altar burning? Or does your freedom mean waywardness? Meaning, does it mean it to instead keep you away from the Lord? So tonight we are learning from the people of old that when freedom comes, freedom comes to get us closer to the altar, that the things that we could not do when we were in captivity, now we should do them even better at the altar. Amen. The things that we could not, were not permitted to do in order to service our altar, now that freedom has come, it's time to get engaged and more involved. It's not a time to stay away. Amen. Life at the altar is most enjoyable. So they began to build the altar of God of Israel, of the God of Israel. Why? To sacrifice burnt offerings. Beloved, there is never an altar without sacrifice. It's not new and specific to us. It's something, it's the way of life throughout scriptures. Wherever you see an altar, you see two other things. You see a priest, you see sacrifice. Evidenced by what we are seeing here, it says, Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shetiel, and his associates, began to build the altar. It wouldn't make sense to build an altar when there is no human attendance to that altar, meaning there is no priests to attend to the altar. You all have altars because you have taken the oil and poured it on, in your home. So you are all priests at your own altar. Amen. So he began to build the altar of the, of, of the God of Israel for this reason, to sacrifice burnt offerings on it. We have spoken at length on this platform what sacrifice is in this day and age. We wouldn't pull cows and goats into our house or houses or backyards to burn them by means of, you know, as way of offering sacrifices to the Lord. Our life is the sacrifice. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Amen. It says, in accordance with what is written in the law of, Mo of Moses, the man of God. Let's read a portion. I just thought I should um, show us one portion to support what this particular last phrase is indicating. Because it says, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Did Moses know about sacrifice, um, sacrifices? Did he know about altars? Did he ever raise one? Do we know of any altar that was raised by Moses? What was the name of the altar that he raised? Now, Exodus 20, um, 20 22 to 26, talks about idols and altar altars. He says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. 
24, make an altar of earth. That was his altar, an altar of earth. I chose this specific example because we're in the earth season, so it will sink even better. He says, make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings. So they were making reference to what Moses had done. So this is what Moses did. He made an altar of earth as, in, as, as instructed by the Lord. And then upon that altar of, altar of earth, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Never an altar without sacrifice. Never. Then it's not an altar. Amen. And then it says, and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle, wherever I cause my name to be honored, I'll come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, <clears throat> excuse me, do not build it with dress stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps or your private parts may be exposed. So those were their instructions. You see, before we raise altars here, we go into fasting to hear the mind of God concerning the altar. What is the name of the altar? What should be done? Who are the angels in charge? Who will be their human attendant to that altar? It's not a new thing. That's how the Lord operates throughout scripture. But here is a very good example for us to you know, relate with, because this is what we do. We raise altars annually, but we don't just do it. We get into fasting to hear the mind of God concerning it. Amen. Now, moving on to verse three, the Bible says, despite their fear of the peoples around them, let's pause there. There was fear, there was an obstacle, and that obstacle was fear, meaning that they were certainly threatened by the people around them. And fear had arisen in the hearts of the people and in the atmosphere of the people, around the people. And, uh, but despite the fear, they continued. The question is, what has caused you to fear to a place where you, you have abandoned your walk? Because your walk is kingdom advancement. What has caused you to fear to a place where you no longer advance the kingdom in the capacity that you've been called to advance the kingdom? What is the fear? Is it the fear of speaking publicly? You can overcome that. Is it the fear that your, your project will not be financed? That too can be overcome. Amen. Is it the fear that provisions will not be made in the time of your um of, of, of you advancing the kingdom in the area that the Lord has called you. The Lord doesn't call you without making provisions. Even at the nick of time, he will. He will come through for us. Amen. So let's be comforted even through Ezra chapter 3, verse 3, that despite fear, be it the fear of people, what will my family say? Let's start from there. What will my friends say? It doesn't matter. The question you and I should be asking is, what will the Lord say? Because one with the Lord is majority, amen? One with God is majority. And it is not your friend's kingdom you're advancing. It's not your mother or your father's kingdom that you're advancing. It is neither your, your kingdom that you're advancing. So your opinion does not count. Our opinions do not count in the process. God's opinion is what matters. Amen. May the fear and the reverence of the Lord overtake us as we advance his kingdom. He says, despite their fear of the peoples around them, they, they build the altar on its foundation and sacrifice burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. So this is very, very important. Why? Because before building the temple, they built an altar meaning that the altar became the foundation of that temple that they were going to build. Even though the temple at large was going to serve as the, the fellowship center where the altar was, but they made sure that the altar was the foundation of that temple. You know, it actually gave me an idea that if as a child of God, we want to build a house, why not raise an altar upon that, that, that land that piece of that plot that you have bought, why not raise an altar there before raising your building so that your building stands upon an altar, just like the temple stood upon the altar that was, um, was built by Zerubbabel and his team. Amen. 
Then he says in verse four, then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord. You see, sacrifice, 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 sacrifice is the language of the kingdom. You and I are saved because somebody sacrificed. Jesus Christ sacrificed his body and his blood. He sacrificed his crown. He sacrificed his position. So we are here because of sacrifice. So you and I cannot move forward without sacrificing because Jesus Christ is the ultimate example and he began his journey by sacrifice. So to our journey should begin with sacrifice and continue with sacrifice. He sacrificed everything about himself for us. Verse six says that on the day, on the first day of the seventh month, seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Meaning that they had laid the foundation of the altar. They, were, they continued to offer sacrifices upon that altar, but they had not yet established the foundation of the temple, but the altar was there. And how many of us know that because the altar is there, that temple will certainly go up? Because that's the guarantee. Because the altar attracts. It does attract. Amen. So just a tip for those who want to build houses. And if you're buying a house, just make sure that the foundation is has been taken care of. Now we go to verse 7 through 8. It talks about rebuilding the temple. Then it says, then they gave, gave money to the masons. You see, they had money then too, to the masons, because like we said yesterday, resources, finances are needed. Amen. So they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food. You see, you, you can give money, but food is also necessary. And drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Thai, so that they will bring cedar locks by sea from Lebanon to Joppa, as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. For those who were not here yesterday, we, we know that this, we just want to be reminded that this project only began because the, the Lord moved the heart of King Cyrus, the king of Persia, to release the children, um, who were, the, the Israelites who were held in Babylonian captivity to go and build, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, which had been destroyed by, by the Babylonians. The Bible now says in verse 8, that in the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Babylon, son of Shetil, Joshua, son of Josadak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from the captivity of Jerusalem to Jerusalem began the work. So it's one thing to say, I will raise the altar, I will build the temple. It's another thing to actually begin the process, amen. How many of us have dreams that we have shelved over years and this year is about to end, that dream has still remained on the shelf. In the name of Jesus, may you go to that shelf and dust out any particle of dust on your dream and resuscitated in the name of Jesus and begin the work. It's not too late. We're still in the month of November. December is still way ahead. You can start doing something about your dreams in the name of Jesus. This morning, I had to actually dust out the dust from my Hebrew Bible. I said, it's about time to start reading the Hebrew Bible once again. Amen. So it's not too late. Let's dust out everything from those dreams that we've shelved. We all have dreams. Let the work begin. Now it says they appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of God. 
we agree that in the house of God, there is protocol. Some people must be assigned to supervise certain departments and supervise certain activities. So when your turn comes, be diligent in your work because in the house of God, there is order, there is protocol so that there is no confusion. Amen. Because the enemy will seek any opportunity to confuse the people. But we there is protocol, there is order, there is supervision for that, for that reason so that there is we maintain order. Because our God is a God of order. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Cadmel and his sons, descendants of Hodavia, and the sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working in the house of God. Amen. Now, we move on to 10 through 11. It says, when the builders laid the foundation... When the builders laid the foundation of what the temple of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph with symbols took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. So what are we seeing here? What can we learn? We can learn here that with every progress whether it's, it's small in your eyes or big in your eyes, with every progress, let's set aside time to glorify the Lord. Amen. Because some people have not even started. So if you have the opportunity to start, why not praise the Lord through every step that you make or take, through every action towards your goal? Look for opportunities to celebrate with people. Look for opportunities to, to thank the Lord, dance unto him, praise him, magnify his name. Recognize that if not for him, you will not be here. Very important. They had only laid the foundation of the temple, only. And now they are already rejoicing. And they still have so much work ahead of them. But who knows whether or not, or whether this praise was going to be that lubricant that will help them move forward even faster. Amen. So let our praises be heard every step of the way. That is why we have testimony Tuesday and we encourage people to testify all the time because with any little project or progress, we need to be praising the Lord because your next step is not guaranteed. Amen. Except for the Lord who will be on your side. So why not thank him for how far he has brought you, knowing that he's taking you to somewhere greater. Amen. Now it says that with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. We can see a similar quotation in Psalm 136 verse 1, which says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. That was David's typical way of praising the Lord. That's why the Bible says that they praise God as prescribed by King, by David, King of Israel. With praise, with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel, his love towards the GDP members endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Did you lay a foundation when it comes to your dream this year? We call upon you to celebrate, to praise the Lord. Amen. Intentionally, on purpose, for his namesake, for his glory, in Jesus' name. So verse 12 through 13 says that, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. Why did the older priests weep while the younger people or the younger priests and Levites shout for joy? Because the older priests had seen the glory, the former glory of the temple and the foundation that was laid by King Solomon. It was nothing compared to what Zerubbabel and his team laid. In their eyes, it was nothing. It was almost like God was a failure. God is failing in this project. Isn't that how some people feel about your success and my success? They'll be like, I've seen better. It used to be way better than what you're doing now. While you rejoice, they lament. 
because they don't see why you should rejoice over the little things in according to them. Amen. He says, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple built by King Solomon, they wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid by Zerubbabel and his team, while many others shouted for joy. Mixed crowd, mixed emotions for different reasons. When others lament because of your progress, do not stop rejoicing because they are lamenting. You were not there then, you are here now, so celebrate what has been made available to you now. They will get over the laments and join you later on. Amen. He says, no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. A mixed multitude, mixed emotions, everything mixed. But do not get confused because others are mourning. I must mourn. Why do you have a reason to mourn? Do you have a reason to weep? Or do you have a reason to rejoice? Let it be small in their eyes, but to you it's big. So why not celebrate the God who has brought you this far? You may be living in a hurt, but for you it's like a mansion because once upon a time you were in a foster home, but now you own a hurt under your own name. Isn't that progress? Once upon a time, you were a beggar on the streets, but now you have a hurt to live in. To someone who lives in the Potomac, your hurt is nothing. But to you, it means everything because you now have autonomy over your environment. There needs to be a shout in the house. You're too quiet for this message. Amen. Too quiet for this message. Yeah. Glory. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Yes. Mm. It's you may meet someone, you may have a PhD, but you have a first, how do we call it here? You may have a GED, but to, and the person with a PhD may laugh at your GED, but little did they know that once upon a time, you couldn't even have access to any form of education. While they laugh at your GED, you rejoice over it because that is how far the Lord has brought you. You will not always be there. They, they lamented, but little did they know that the glory of this temple will be greater than the glory of the former temple. Amen. 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 That's a message for someone. Now let's look at something to prove what we are talking about. The older priests lamented. But if they knew what the, the Lord had declared over Zerubbabel, they wouldn't have lamented. They would have rejoiced over that foundation that was built. We're reading here from Zechariah chapter 4. Listen to verse 8, 9, and 10. Or verse, yes, verse 8, 9, and 10. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. He didn't end there. Then he says, His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. So it's going, it's, I hope it's answering the question I asked at the beginning, right there. Then he says, who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. The older priests wept. Little did they know that Zerubbabel had a promise from the Lord that he will not only lay the foundation, but he will complete the building. And the glory of this building will be greater than the glory of the former building. Amen. Amen. So Zerubbabel laid the foundation. Zerubbabel built the temple, evidenced by Zechariah chapter 4. 8 to 10. Now let's look at the book of Haggai. I'm going to read verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. It's very important. We're trying to emphasize the point of um, Ezra chapter, the last verses, chapter 3 and verse, verse uh, 12, 13 that we just read, that the people wept while others rejoiced. It says, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. 
We just read about Zechariah. Now this is prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shetil, is the same Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josada, those names sound familiar, the high priest and to the remnant of the people, those who returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. This is what you should tell them. Ask them, who of you is left? Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? Because there was a former glory. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? This is addressing the older people who are, who are, who are alive to see the former and the present. Doesn't it seem to you like nothing? But listen, this is what the Lord says. But now be strong, Zerubbabel. The Lord is not concerned about the people, the naysayers. He's concerned about the person who has been given the assignment because that person needs all the encouragement. He says, now, but now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And walk, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. I want you to begin to receive this as encouragement for your own kingdom advancement project. Because many have walked you and said nothing good can come out of you. But tonight we are changing the trajectory in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord is saying, but now be strong. Put your name there, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you. We need to put in the work. The Lord will be with us while we put in the work. Amen. Declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Amen. Do not fear. Whatever the fears are, do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come. And I'll fill this house, this house with glory says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house, talking about the temple that Zerubbabel is building, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty. In this place, I'll grant peace because they left from confusion to a land of peace. So the only thing that the Lord could do was to give them peace because Jerusalem means peace. Salem means peace. Jerusalem means city of peace, Babylon, confusion. So they left a place of confusion to a place of peace and the Lord reinforced that in this small temple that everybody considers small, the glory will be greater in this house than in the former house. And in this place, you receive peace. May you receive that word and run with it in the name of Amen. And let's just give a shout. I don't know. Do something to the Lord. Amen. Just, I don't know. Just Amen. want to jump to Amen. 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 Thank you, thank you, Lord. That when people laugh at our Lord, if you can speak in tongues, I think now is the time to start. Let us love at our little beginnings. So do they know that we have a promise? Than your name, a promise from you, Father, to complete the project. Yes. Oh, it doesn't matter what the situation is. There is a promise. For as long as there is a promise, uh, the Lord may... is solid to deliver. And the glory of this small house will be greater than the glory. Oh. Of the Amen. Amen. And the Lord Amen. Himself will be present. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Yes, Lord. It may be small to their eyes, but the peace of the Lord surpasses all. Amen. The of the Lord surpasses all. Thank you. 
Thank there you. is a word. Therefore, the Lord will surely deliver. Amen. In the work for his glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 The faithfulness of the Lord. The faithfulness of our Lord. So that's chapter three for us. Amen. Very powerful. Very powerful. Let's just continue to praise the Lord. Father, we just Oh, you don't know what to say. You've never been despised for your little beginnings. I can understand why you're quiet because you've never been despised. You've never engaged in any project and be opposed. That is why you're quiet tonight. But for those who have been opposed, I want you to lift up your voices tonight and praise the name of the Lord who has brought you this far. When you started, it thought it was nothing. God has promised it. Daughter and son of God, that will move forward to the glory of this house. Break out the glory of the former house. That Being obstructed by the naysayers, you will not know how to worship mm. the Lord in times Thank like this. You don't know the pain of it. Mm. For those who know, those of us who know the pain of beginning and being opposed, opposed mm. in the process, mm. we know how to celebrate God because we oh, love the pain. Okay, so we began building, but those who had been in the field before thought Thank we're you. just children in this journey. The Lord says the glory of this house is to be greater than the glory of the former house. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. But Amen. I receive this word for my life, for myself, for my family, in the Amen. name of Jesus. And I receive it for everyone on this platform. In Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. We receive it. In the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for the word. Bless you, Mama Mildred. Thank you, Lord. No discouragement. None. They don't know what the Lord told you when you started. Amen. If they knew what Zerubbabel had been told, they wouldn't have wept. They would have rejoiced with him. Amen. They would have. Why weep over a greater glory? They would have been weeping that the glory in the former house is less if they knew, but they did not know. Amen. Amen. I can't even continue. I'm trying. We will. We will. God is good. So that alone, what they experienced was enough to discourage them. Does that sound like discouragement to any of us? That would have stopped them from moving forward. Because they're trying to rejoice over the work of God, but others are not joining them in this process. Now we move on to chapter four. And the Bible says opposition to the, build, to the rebuilding. Now this is where we see all manner of challenges. It says when the enemies of Judah, you see that enemies of Judah, 
and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel. They came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Like, really? If you had been praising the same God, why are you making the God seem like it is my God and you're just trying to help me in the process? I thought you just said that you have been sacrificing to him. So are you sacrificing to someone who is not your God and you want to help me accomplish the process? What is this telling us? I really want to read through before I start explaining. Let me do that. But let me say this, whom we in get involved or allowed to be involved in the process matters. Because these people who came to them were their enemies, the Samaritans. They came to them. But the, if they would have allowed the Samaritans to be part of this journey, what will eventually happen is that they will have to allow them to worship in the temple. And you and I know that the Samaritans worship other gods as well. So it will mean that they will bring their idols into the temple. Why? Because I helped you build. So why should I not be a partaker of what you're doing inside? So we need to be careful whom we allow in the process of building. Okay, I have peace about explaining as I go. So I'll do that. I just got an inner witness. So it says, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have your God, amen, and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Verse three says, but Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in, this, in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. No compromise. This is what it's telling us. You will not compromise in the journey and in the process to rebuilding or advancing the kingdom. Because if we compromise in the process, along the line, we'll experience challenges that will require that we break down that building. Breaking down the building means many things. It could mean breaking down a physical building. It may mean ending something that is not in, in accordance with the word. It may mean the Lord disapproving of something that you think is correct because along the side, you're, along the way, you're compromising. May we refrain from compromise. Most often we compromise out of desperation. We compromise out of desperation. We get money from sources that we should not get it because the business must grow yesterday, not tomorrow, not even now. We compromise on our future partners. Even when it's not pleasing to the Lord, we want to manage through. We compromise in our education. In this day and age, people buy degrees yet and now they cannot even deliver. There are so many ways at our jobs we compromise. We don't put in the hours yet we get paid. Let the truth be told in the name of Jesus. So these people and Zerubbabel and his team refused to compromise. They refused and that's why the temple stood. He says, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for you, for the, for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to look at another um, you know, obstacle to discourage the people of Judah. These people that were discouraging the people of Judah were mostly the Samaritans to discourage, those are all obstacles to kingdom advancement. Your business could be kingdom advancement, but have you been discouraged in the process? 
These are all obstacles that the enemy throws our way. Sometimes you get discouraged because you discouraged yourself. But most often we get discouraged because of what people do to us. Amen. Have you been discouraged? What did you do about it? Did you submit yourself to it or did you prevail? Did you rise over it? Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. So fear, fear. Look at this. They bribed all kinds of obstacles. They bribed officials to work against them. That is how far the enemy will go. He will bribe other people to come and discourage you from advancing the project that God has given you. And how many of us fall for the tricks of the enemy? The, the kingdom work is not for the faint of heart, okay? Amen. I have to be tenacious. Cry, but keep it going. Be discouraged, no doubt, but keep pushing. It's not for the weak. It's not for the weakling. It says, they bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Then look at this. This is later opposition under Xerxes and Artaxerxes, or you can call um, Ahasuerus, but Xerxes and Artaxerxes. Now look at this. There are two parts here, which I want us to pay attention to while we study. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation. You see that the obstructions or the obstacles did not stop coming. They lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. These people just want to build their temple and have peace, but the people around them will not let them. And in the days of Artaxerxes, I want you to see that the kings have now changed. During Xerxes' time, it was accusation. Now, in the days of Artaxerxes, which is, in this case, Ahasuerus, the one you see in the Queen Esther, king of Persia, Bishlam, Mithredath, Tabil, and the rest of his associates wrote a letter to Artaxerxes or Ahasuerus. The letter was written in Aramaic scripts and in the Aramaic language. That's what it was written in. It wasn't written in um, Hebrew. It says, Rehum, the commanding office officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, wrote a letter against Jerusalem. You see that? Against Jerusalem. To Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. So now let's read the letter, then we'll talk about this letter. Rehum, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, together with the rest of their associates, the judges, officials, and administrators over the people of Persia, Iraq, and Babylon, the Elamites of Susa, and, uh, the, and the other people whom the great and honorable Ashuba Nepal deported and settled in the city of Samaria and else, elsewhere in Trans-Euphrates. So he's talking about all the people who are involved, who have the group that have come together to gang against the children of, um, uh, the, of Judah and Benjamin. All of them, this group of people, many. But let's remember that one with God is a majority. One with God is a majority. He says, this is a copy of the letter they sent. So let's read this letter. To King Artaxerxes from your servants in Trans-Euphrates, the king should know that the people who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem as if he did not know and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. Can you imagine that? They are re restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, I'm going to read the letter. We'll come back to it. Furthermore, the king should know that if this city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tributes, or duty will be paid. And, the, and eventually the royal revenues will suffer. Now, since we are under obligation to the palace and it is not proper for us to see the king dishonored, 
and we are sending this message to inform the king so that a search may be made in the archives of your predecessors. In these records, you will find that this city is a rebellious city, troublesome to kings and provinces, a place with a long history of sedition. That is why this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is built, and its walls are restored, you'll be left with nothing in trans-Euphrates. What a convincing letter. I mean, if you had a king and you received this, you'll be so convinced because look at a group of people who have gathered to write this letter to him and listen to how convincing the words are, all in an attempt to stop the kingdom advancement project that was in progress. Now, what the people said was not a lie. These people of Jerusalem had, be, had been rebellious. They had acted in light of what was written to the king. But that was then, not the present moment when they were rebuilding the city. So the people were making a case of their past, not their present. In the past, they were rebellious. In the past, they did not pay their taxes and tributes and all of that. They acted waywardly. That is true. But where they were at that moment, that is not where, what, who they were. They were different people. How many of you are about to advance a project? and your naysayers are holding you captive based on your past. Your past is your past. They remember it, but Jesus Christ doesn't. Whose report will you believe? Will you believe the report of your naysayers and stop the advancement of this project? Or will you believe the report of Jesus Christ and progress with your kingdom advancement project? Once upon a time, you were a prostitute, just an example. And now the God has called you to become a pastor. And some people will not join your congregation because they know you as a prostitute. Will you refuse the calling of a pastor because your naysayers say you were a prostitute, but now you are a, pa a pastor or will you believe the report of Jesus who says I have separated you as far your sins as far as the east is from the west and my blood has washed away your sins and now you are a new creation in Christ Jesus and now I've called you I've given you a, a, a word and I've given you the resources to go and advance my kingdom Whose reports will you believe? Will you allow your past to stagnate you? Will you allow your past to stop you from making progress in the kingdom? Are you ashamed? Are you too ashamed of your past that it has arisen, has prevailed over your future? And now you have no future because your past has become king and lord over you. In other words, it has become an owner of you. Lord means owner. Who owns you? Does your past own you? Or does a glorious future with Christ own you? They made a case. Who is making a case against you? And that case is so true. We agree with the enemy that yes, we were once rebellious. Yes, in the past, we did not pay our dues like we, we should. Enemy, we agree. So what can you do now that we agree? We are agreeing with you quickly so that you will not throw us to the judge and the judge will not throw us into prison. We agree. So what do you have to say? They made a case against them. The case was true. But it was not true as of the moment because these people were different people. They knew better. But it was all in an attempt to stop this project. Now, they spoke like they were, you know, they, were, they had the king's back, <laughs> but truly they didn't. <laughs> but for this particular project, they had to come together. Now, verse 17 says that the king sent this reply to Rehum, the commanding officer, 
Shimshire, the secretary, and the rest of their associates living in Samaria and elsewhere in Trans Euphrates. He says, greetings, now he's responding. The letter you sent us has been read and translated in my presence. I issued an order and a search was made. And it was found that this city has a long history of revolt against kings and has been a place of rebellion and sedition. Jerusalem has had powerful kings ruling over the whole of Trans Euphrates and taxes, tributes and duty were paid to them. Now issue an order to these men to stop work. Do you see that? Because a king finally believed them. So that this city will not be rebuilt until I, I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interests? Do we see that? Then look at this. As soon as the copy of the letter of King Atazexus was read to Rehum and Shimshir, the secretary and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop. How could they continue? The king says, stop. So their plot finally worked. But who is making a case about your past and is actually working against you in this present age, in your future, your present? Who? What, why have you stopped doing what you know you should be doing? Just because they said, just because they knew me to be. The question is, who are you now? Because the children of Israel were no longer who they used to be. Yes, they were rebellious. They do not deny that. The records prove it. The pictures prove it. The cloud has recorded. Facebook has the message about your past. Every social media has records about you, how you used to be. They can bring the evidences to court and they will win the case. The question is, who are you now? That's the question that you should be answering. There is no doubt about who you used to be, but do you know who you are now? Until we know who we are, we will never continue to advance the kingdom like we are supposed to. I'm gonna highlight one more point and then the floor will be open for conversations. So here, when they were writing here, I wanna emphasize once again that this temple was actually built. This is another scripture to help us. Okay, so it says, then the people in verse four, then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building because they started the process. Now, when they were writing to the king, this is what they said. So in verse 12, it says, the king should know that the people who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. You see, they are restoring, meaning that you will not restore the wall if you have not built, amen, because the walls coming after, or just depends on how you, you, your, your architectural work plan looks like. But most, most definitely, the wall was, the, was one of the final things, because when um, Nehemiah came in, he came to build the wall because the temple was already there. So these people apparently had built, but the wall, when they started doing building the wall, they couldn't advance because at this point, Atazexis, King Atazexis had put a stop to the project. He had put a stop to it. Now, let's, let me just read something to us here. I didn't have that open, just so that we make 
we correlate this with Nehemiah. Let's just look at Nehemiah chapter one. Let's look at verse three and four. Mm. Anyway, let's read verse one through four. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. You see that? The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Amen. So that is why when we will be studying Nehemiah, you see that he went to rebuild that wall to complete the project. And he came in with a third group of people. And as we get more into Ezra, you realize that his primary role, even though he came with the second group of captives, um, his primary role was to restore the word of the Lord back to the people. Amen. Amen. So that's what I have for us today. I pray and I believe that we have been blessed. Amen. So the floor is open to comments. Thank you, Mama Mildred, for that yeah. powerful word that you gave us tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. So, hi, good evening, Dr. Mildred. Good evening, Sister June. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm, I'm doing very well. I, I was literally leaving work and logged in and was like listening to your message and like shouting to God, like, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Right. Um, you know, and as I listened more to you, um, I, I posted it in the chat, like you were all up in my business, the, you know what I'm saying? Like all up in it, you know, when you said, you know, um, you once was a prostitute, but now God has called you to a pastor. I'm like, boy, she really in my business. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, God, no, no, no. Because you know, it is definitely God. It is definitely God. Like on just about every word you say in um this evening, God was literally, you know, speaking through you to me. And I even posted in there in the chat, and you said, This message is for somebody. And I was like, It's me, Dr. Mildred. It's me. <laughs> and like, um, you know. I, I have to like literally wait until testimony Tuesday because this testimony mm, 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 that, that's tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, that's every, every day this month is testimony day, so you can testify tomorrow morning. Oh, I, I'm on it. I'm uh, my alarm's already set. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I, I just I just praise God, you know, because like He knows exactly. Um what we need, um, when we need it, how we got to hear it, you know, like he, he just, he just knows, you know, and, um, man, I, I'm telling you, like, I, I, I just, I find it hard to, um, find it, um, to believe that you have to literally say, like, let's come on, like, like, let's praise him. Like, I'm already shouting, you know what I mean? Like, I'm already shouting, to God because you know when when you when you're in focus with God and into that intimate relationship with him and he is just moving and you're trusting you're believing you know and I'll get more into it tomorrow morning but boy look at here boy 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 <laughs> amen amen that's all I can say anymore is amen amen glory be to god thank you dr mildred thank you dr kwame um thank you for this platform and for foremost you know however you want to say it like that but um 
I just, uh, man, I can't praise God enough. I just really cannot praise God enough because God literally showed up and literally showed out. When I tell you God show up and showed out today, hear what I said. He showed up and showed out. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sister. I want to go next. I just want to say one thing mm, that, <laughs> excuse me, because I'm, I'm eating. So the God that is present here today is Obinigwe. Obinigwe. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Make sure you come back. <laughs> You're not Tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. 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 Can I go next? Yes, please. All right. I thank you, Mama Mildred, for tonight's teaching. When uh, I think it was in uh, chapter three where the elders were crying, mm -hmm. when the younger people were celebrating the Lord for. Uh, the later glory they are seen. And for me, when I was reading it, I read it twice. I felt like when people don't know what you are going through, or when people don't know what the Lord told you, when people don't understand what the Lord is doing in your life, they might take things for granted. So for me, I thought these older people were crying for joy. They were happy that the temple is getting rebuilt because they know what the Lord did there before. That is uh, how I saw it before you explain it the other way. And the other way to make it makes sense because a lot of people said, what good can come out of your Jerusalem? What good can come out of your Nazareth? And when we go to chapter four, when they said, uh, uh, first uh, chapter four, verse one, the enemy of Judah and Benjamin heard the exile were rebuilding the temple. Yeah, the enemy of uh, our house, our enemy, that knew us before. When they will hear that the Lord is using us to do something wonderful, they will gather and plot things against us. So we are trying to advance God's kingdom. That's why the enemy, the devil, will use them, will put things in their mind to come and test us by saying in uh, verse two. So they approach Zerubbabel and the other leader and say, let us build with you for we worship your God just as you do. We have sacrificed to him ever since King Ezahedon of Assyria brought us here. All right. By, by saying that if we lack discernment, we lack wisdom, we might compromise by letting them to build with us. But these people were never on your side. So it's very good to always have discernment. Okay. The Holy Spirit is with us. So whoever you are trying to do business with, whoever you, you think you are... Uh, Working with always get discernment. If not, the enemy can use them. And I like the way Jerusalem, uh, Zerubbabel and the leaders replied. You may not, you may have no part in this work. We alone will build the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. It's always good to have discernment and be on our ground. 
and just four. And so then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them. They can bribe other people to come to frustrate you, to even infiltrate your people. We always need discernment. And this went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until the Persia. So we know that the enemy will be looking for opportunities all the time to come back. And when the letter was, the letter was uh, written and sent to the king, verse 15, we suggest that a researcher be made in your ancestors' record where you will discover what a rebellious, a rebellious city it has been in the past. Because the enemy knows our so the enemy would like to use our past against us. Say, so in fact, it was destroyed because of its long and troublesome story uh, against the king's country. The enemy will go back and bring our past against us. But we need to remember that our past was wiped away blot out by the blood of the lamb so that even yeah. if we are bringing our past against us, it should not mean anything because we are not in that era anymore we are advancing with the kingdom of god hallelujah mm -hmm. and the king went ahead and did the research people are going to, to do the research they will go and dig your background to know who you used to be. But like Mama Midwest said, majority they continue trusting our God gave us the assignment. The God that called us to be the one on that assignment. He honor his word more than his name. He will not change what he said he will do. He will always in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's what I need to add. Amen. Welcome. Amazingly, he, he, the king made a research of the past, but he did not inquire about the present. You know, when you Amen. <laughs> he would have researched both and then come to Informed they never have time to search the present, not the future, because they don't have the power to control the present and the future. Yeah, the devil is a liar, has always been. <laughs> he surely is, boy. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much, Mama Mel. Um, so my my little takeaway, I don't think that it was little um, in my head. It's pretty grandiose. But so like in, in chapter three, you know, you really emphasize the altar and um, what they what they offered on the altar, right? Like the burned offerings and and really from verse three to five we see words like sacred that shows up right like even ver chapter three verse five says after that they presented the regular burn offering the offerings the new moon sacrifices and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the lord as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord. Amen. Um, so understanding that we, we understand altars and the mystery, just having altars and just how sacred they are, right? And so then we jump to chapter four, which what really stood out to me 
is um, verse one, chapter verse one, all the way to verse three, when, you know, Zerubbabel refuses help from, from these people. Amen. And so the message there was because they're building essentially the altar of the Lord. You can't let your enemies into your altar. Amen. Um, you can't, you can't let the enemy in your secret. That, that was my takeaway that your covenant with the Lord is sacred and you have to be extremely careful who you let or now altar. And just like Sister Coco said, discernment is really important because again, the devil comes to still kill and destroy. And he doesn't, he doesn't usually come dressed as, you know, dressed as an angel. Sorry, he doesn't come dressed as a devil. He comes disguised as an angel, right? But then what would be the consequences if, um, Joshua and Zerubbabel had received help to build the altar of the Lord. What would be the consequences if they would have gotten so close? Would they not have destroyed, even tainted that? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, you know, we can apply in our everyday lives, right? Like when you, if, if something is sacred and you have a space where you've decided to honor the Lord, it is, it's not for everyone. It's not to have a party over there because even the Lord says, even the Lord mentioned what should be offered on his altar. Amen. And so that, that was my takeaway. And, and I was really blessed tonight. So thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for that observation. And uh, as you were speaking, now I, I just want to stretch it a little bit. What if your altar is your home? The question is, what do we allow? What do we permit in our homes? Because Amen. that's really what it is. And certainly we are altars, moving altars, mobile altars. What do we allow into us, Amen. on us, around us? Amen. Even the things we wear, what we eat, the companies we keep, companionships we keep, because we are the first altars, even before a stationary one. Amen. Amen. So just something to think about. Amen. Amen. Life at the altar is a very sacred life. The benefits are good, but the sacrifices are huge. All for our benefits. Life without boundaries is no life to live. So the um, um, altars provide us the boundaries that we need to live. Amen. Amen. Any other thoughts? I wanted to add a woman with Purba, the actor before. And uh, you reminded us that uh, we need to be good for if you buy a land. Uh, put on the altar of the Lord before you built on it, before you built your house. The children of the other's kingdom, they do. I remember <laughs> when I was young and my aunt bought her land, I remember things were made on the land before they had been. And um, a lot of people were born in that house. But uh, something happened and she sold the house. So 
whatever <laughs> was done in the house, thank God, nobody is stepping foot in there anymore. Even though it was painful, but I remember things were done seriously. And most of them were done at night. So the, king, the children of the other kingdom understand it very well. So we, children of God, knowing this today, let's run with it. It is very, very important. Amen. Thank you for that observation, Sister Koko. I want to ex extend that thought process so that it's even more applicable in this day and age. Most of whom we buy houses now and uh, very few people build from scratch. Because when you build from scratch, if you have this knowledge, you can work on the foundation spiritually and all of that. And that's taken care of if you have the knowledge at that time. But what if you buy the house? What do you do? That's what we always encourage people to anoint the house, pour some oil in the toilet, flush it into the foundations, speak to it. Because like the family you're talking about, they did something on the land. Let's say they did something evil. When you inherit that property, you inherit the evil of that property. For example, if we decide to sell our homes now, there is an old our home now, there is an altar in this home. Whoever comes into this home will benefit from our sacrifices. Do we see that? Just like they'll benefit positively, so too. When you inherit the evil altar, you, you suffer the consequences. Life is very spiritual. Sometimes we may be binding and casting many things, but the real thing, it could even be the house that is haunted. And as a result, the inhabitants are suffering the consequences of it. But we are, our prayer points are focused on many things, but the foundation of the house. Amen. So life is very spiritual. We need to be very careful. Let's be altar-minded, <laughs> oriented, even in the purchasing of houses. Do due diligence. Anoint the, the four corners of your home. Find a way to get that oil into the foundation in, of that home. Raise an altar in that home. Speak to the atmosphere. Introduce yourself to the soil in that environment change the instructions that have been given to that environment so that it now works in your favor. Amen. The, yeah. Now, I've heard scenarios whereby there are plots, there are lands somewhere, there's a piece of land somewhere, and these people are not ready to establish any building there because of finances or just maybe it's not time. And they have come, let's say they come like a church and they declare over that, that piece of land that no business will thrive in this particular X number of acres of land. Only a church building will succeed here. They speak to that earth, they release instructions, they raise an altar there and they leave. And then you know how it goes in certain countries, people buy land and sell land upon land that you have multiple certificates on one land. People will sell that land which has been spoken upon to a business. Business will come there, build, invest, do everything, never succeed. File for bankruptcy, another business will come and try, will not succeed and the cycle continues. Why? Because the land has only one instruction. Only a church will thrive here. So if you bring business, it will not work. You bring school, no. If it is not church oriented, going nowhere. So that's how sensitive these things are. Very sensitive. Then now when they finally build a church, everything thrives because now the land is saying, okay, now you're doing what I've been told to do. So I'll work in your favor because you're not operating in accordance to the instructions that were given to me. Very important, where you live matters. Speak to the earth, change the instructions, raise an altar, define the territories of your living space in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dr. Mildred, can I say something? Sure. So um, 
<clears throat> before I moved into where I, I, I'm living right now, which I've been here like a, a, a whole entire year, right? Um, so the Lord actually like opened this door here where I'm living at now, right? I live by myself, me and my two dogs and now five puppies. So um, before I even moved in here, before I, you know, put like anything inside this, 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 uh, this place, right? I called Pastor Jones on the phone and I said, Pastor Jones, I got the place, right? Can you and Dr. Jones come down here and we anoint this house, right? They were so happy. They, they came, right? And they stood in this house. We walked up and it's a trailer. So we walked back and forth from one end to another. I think it was like four or five hours just praying, just praying, dumping oil everywhere, right? So after I moved in here, right, I moved everything in, you know, I'm thanking God for this house. And it was like, literally, I would just lay down on the couch and just look around. And I was like, you know, God, this may be a trailer to some folk, but you know what? This is like a mansion to me right now. And like, I am so grateful, so thankful, right? And then about, mm, about two months later, come to find out that the person that lived here prior, like I was always curious, what was that weird smell I kept smelling in the house, right? But I kind of like overlooked it, you know what I mean? And like, I'm super, super clean, like super clean, super organized, everything. And so um, I just like overlooked it. Like I, I it, it, like I thought about it for a split second and then it went, you know, I was done with it, right? And then two months later, come to find out that the prior tenant, right, was, uh, I can't remember if he, he was born a girl and wanted to be a boy or vice versa, but he was a transvestite, right? And he died in the bedroom and nobody found him for four days, right? So if it was not for me listening to God, and hearing God's voice and calling Pastor Jones and, and God moving on both Dr. Jones and Pastor Jones at the same time, because, you know, they're busy people, you know, and they drove all the way here five hours and spent five hours inside my house praying, anointing, you know, and then left, went back to Georgia. You know what I mean? And so um, since. Let me tell you something. I have, I have, like, I can't even, I have ridiculous, ridiculous favor, right? With me, the landlord, everything. And so this house has been such a blessing to me. Like, I, I, I really like it. I really do, you know? And side note, like, I hate trailers. I hate them. I really don't like them, you know? But I love this place. Why? Because one, God gave it to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I, I love it. I love this place. And I'm going to tear it. You know, I'm going to miss it when I when I move out and the Lord opened the door. But it is so important. Exactly what you said. When you get land, when you get a house, make sure before you even move a stitch in that house, you go through that house. You you, you got a shofar, blow the shofar. You you pray, anoint everything and everything. I'm telling you, it, it, and watch God move. Amen. 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 Yeah, just for those who do Airbnbs, just be careful. Amen. Be careful. If you must, go with your anointing oil. Because even when we go to hotels, the first thing, we just raise the altar immediately. <laughs> because... Things happen, but the Airbnbs and I think they're even worse. But just be careful. Amen. Okay, that's our story for tonight. We thank God. Could we just unmute together and thank the Lord for everything? 
Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for refreshing our spirits. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for ministering to our hearts tonight. Holy Spirit, for your presence. Thank you for the word that has been that has been so in the hearts of your children. I doubt that every one of us is blessed with this word, oh God. And every listener will be transformed as a listener in the name of yes, Lord. And then we say thank you for the new thing that you're doing in our midst, Father. That we will no longer yield and submit ourselves to um, obstacles and no hinder us from advancing your kingdom. And despite the odds, we are moving forward. Despite the odds, we are prevailing in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. And we know that the obstacles will come, so we have armed ourselves necessary tools and weapons in order to overcome those things. Father, we say thank you because our identity is an armor. So we are secured in your identity for us. Father, we say thank you. Today we declare, and I want the redeemed of the Lord to say so, that I know who I am in Christ. I know who I am. <laughs> Christ, my past does not determine my future, nor my present, because I know who I am in Christ. I am determined by the grace of God to advance the kingdom despite the odds. In the name of Jesus, Father, we say thank you for establishing us tonight in this glorious truth. And we will run with it all the days of our lives. In the name of Jesus, we declare that we have capacity, that we are tenacious, that we have integrity, we have yes. discernment. In the name of Jesus, Father, you use it to advance your kingdom. In this day and age, oh God, we declare that we are content with what we've given us, oh Father. We will not carry around the spirit of competition, but we are confident in the words that you have given us, just like you gave Zerubbabel. And we are confident that the glory of this house that you're building now is greater than the glory of the former house which you built then in the name of Jesus. Whether we are comforted in this truth and we will run with it until Jesus comes. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's share our greetings. Greetings of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. And surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. 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 Have a good night, family. And see you. You too. God bless you all. God bless you all. Good night, family. Good night.